Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, this is our, well, this is my first time as a host on StreamYard, and it's our very special guest, Peter Mark Adams, first time as a guest on StreamYard. So bear with us both, as uh, as I'm really looking forward to having this chat, and we've got a few visuals for you, which is one of the reasons we're doing it this way. If you're listening on the audio, uh, well, you can come and watch the video later. Most of it, you'll be fine. If you're driving, please don't try and watch this on YouTube. Please just play the MP3 as per normal, and and we'll uh, we'll get on with it. But Mr. Adams, welcome back. How have you been? Wonderful, Gordon. Surviving the pandemic. Uh, lovely to be back on with you. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, um, yeah, absolutely. I think we'll we'll start with uh, the book and uh, and congratulations on said book, which I have in front of me. No, I'm going to do it better. I have even arranged little pictures. I'm going to go to screen share. No, oh, back in here. Screen share. The Power of the Healing Field. And this is yeah. the Inner Traditions page for it. But congratulations on the book, sir. Thanks. Um, why this book? Why this book? Because, um, strangely enough, I wrote this book about a decade or so ago, the, the first version of it. And um, it, it was recommended, actually, to Inner Traditions. And, and that caused me to come back to it and re- think the content in a fundamental way so pretty well it's a it's a brand new book uh based on a backbone of content that i developed over a decade ago but now freshly updated with healing stories and spiritual encounters and uh, with the other than human um and it, it felt a good time to bring it out when there's such an onus on self-healing and increasing your immune system and it, it's really the essence of the healing path that mm -hmm. i wanted to bring to people and show them the dynamic potentials especially of the healing tools and techniques that are available today yeah there's a couple of things there and i think you're right well you're right about a bunch of stuff um, so I've been following Lynn McTaggart's work for maybe 20 years now, right? And so I've got like really old versions of, of those first books. And a lot has happened in the sort of, particularly if you're a journalist like she is, like in, in terms of researching the field and biogeometry and remote healing and all that kind of stuff. A decade is a long time in in like the, in the world of the field, right? So uh, it it, I, I think you're correct that, it's good for the book to come out now because there's something about there's been a change in the field uh, that field discussions are where they should be. And it's, the timing is interesting. We are saying before we hit record, there are some books, hopefully, whose time, I think, cross fingers, ha has come because uh, after, you know, working on Animistic for as long as we did and with the delays because of how the world's going, uh, my book with Scarlet Imprint, is available for pre-order this week and you are of course a fellow scarlet imprint author so i'm very yeah. i'm very happy to be speaking to you <laughs> yeah there's a kind of synchronicity there isn't there you know if, if there's a benchmark for this 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 sea change in thought it's possibly in the area of analytic philosophy gone because i'm seeing in that area which which is the discipline i studied by the way many moons ago panpsychism is now a conference, a serious conference issue <laughs> amongst the hardcore philosophers. And that, that, that tells you something. That would have been impossible a decade ago. Uh, yeah, you, I, I think there's definitely something to that, right? Like I think, uh, well, it actually reminds me going all the way back to something a bit earlier, uh, well, a lot, a lot earlier, Robert Anton Wilson, right? Like it's steam trains when it's steam train time. And, yeah. the, and these ideas and this sort of um, uh, the living intelligence, the living fields, and and uh, that kind of decentral relationality and also remote relationality, right? That's another way of saying decentral. We used words in the 20th century like non-local and, and they're fine. But what I appreciated, what I appreciate about using the term field, and I'm going to define it in a minute, is that it kind of allows us to jettison back into the 20th century a lot of that quantum talk uh yeah. and and not necessarily having to rely on experiments to do with the location of an electron so heavily and actually look at 
field research, um, as in yeah. research of uh, and around the field. And I and it's it, the word is more, the word is better for a start. And you kind of know what the 20th century was trying to get at with people going like, oh well, quantum blah 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 teaches us blah blah blah, right? Yeah. Uh, but there's something about the field as a term and a framework that like people's ears prick up and 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 the word still has i think potency uh, it still uh, it captures people's attention and it, it feels like a thing they want to pay attention to so uh i've i've actually asked lynn this as well so i'm going to ask you what is the field <laughs> well there's only one explanation for it. It, it it it's reality is like a coin with two faces and and one face is the qualitative world of our phenomenal experience and the other face of the coin is the world of quantitative reality but there's only one coin it's not as though uh, there's two separate realities we're not into dualism anymore with this worldview um, and i would go one step further gordon I, I think this is now established at such a level uh, even amongst the intellectual elite, that we can now move on and start talking about animism, which is a step beyond panpsychism. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and that was because I, I brought that up with Rupert Sheldrake as well. I, I think um, panpsychism still cleaves to, I like it better than materialism. And this is, I, I do that caveat because I, there are plenty of panpsychists out there and they're better than materialists, right? So yeah. all good. Uh, yeah. But panpsychism still carries with it a kind of materialist assumption that um, complexity in consciousness is is associated with molecular complexity, or at least yeah. lots of molecules, and and that is not the case. And and in particular, like it's not the case demonstrably in in much of the the research people like Lynn McTaggart ha have been writing about. It is demonstrably de de demonstrably not true. Because you plants, you can measure plants communicating with each other, and they don't have what we would consider to be a brain, right? Yeah. And so there's this idea that you have um, personality and and intelligence associated with molecular comp complexity, which isn't there. But it is that, like, if you drop that idea, you're basically in the universe is a community of beings, which I yeah. think it is, right? Yeah. And and I yeah. agree. I think panpsychism is a helpful step in the direction of animism yes yes nice. so I, th I think for people like ourselves who are perhaps more exposed to the experiential edges of experience let's say that that makes sense um the move towards animism is where our energy is focused right now and it, it's to acknowledge the great variety of contacts we have in other dimensions and in other frequencies. It's, it's like, I don't know whether those two are the same thing, but it seems to me the manifestations I've been witness to seem to invoke two different areas, one a frequency one and one a dimensional one. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I've always found interesting about that, so if we like an entity model or a spirit model, let's just say, uh, I, I've done, I'm a big fan of Dr. Daniel Foer's work when it comes to like ancestral lineage repair and so on. I've read his book yeah. and I've done training with him and all the rest of it. Yeah. And one of the things he said when he was, I'm not sure if he's still practicing as a psychologist, was he would start off by telling people, even if you don't believe in spirits, let's do this. If, if you're yeah. like, yeah. someone's dealing with alcoholism and it's an inherited family situation, he's like, mm -hmm. okay. Even if you don't believe in spirits, just say this stuff out loud, and and to do with that that kind of lineage repair and making sure any blessings come down and not the curses and so on. Yeah, it works better, even if they don't believe it, than a system that doesn't call in spirits, right? So yeah. the panpsychism model, which is like, okay, well maybe there aren't discarnate spirits because uh, intelligence is kind of like at the interior of matter, but the human brain is very complex, so it can invent these ideas for themselves for itself that will help it heal. That's that's all true. Um, but if that were the case, it would work more or less as well as standard kind of like alcohol intervention therapy, but specifically calling on and incorporating beings, whether you believe in them or not, 
leads to better clinical outcomes. Now that is, to me is very good evidence for the existence of spirits. Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole experience I've had with Reiki is exactly like that. Um, the strength and power of the energy is proportionate to the level of alignment you have mentally, physically, with a spiritual intelligence rather than with a light switch. You know, it, yeah. it, okay, the Reiki works if you just don't believe in it, but you put your hands on. It works. But when you align yourself with it, it's like you, have, you establish a partnership. I think yeah. that's the best way. And even though you're just the channel in that connection, um, it gets stronger the less of you there is in it. So this seems to suggest, I mean, it's not my energy, Gordon. So it's coming from somewhere. It's very focused. It's very directed. But it's always yeah. um, containable. It's never overwhelming. The and shaman that, that, is the hollow bone, right? Like that's the, no, like it's definitely not your energy. You just, it, it yeah. comes through you. I think that's wonderful. I, I actually I was reading a book about, it's called the psychic roots of disease uh, recently, like last yeah. week. And at the beginning of it, the doctor's saying like, after 30 years, I can tell you with confidence, I have never healed or cured anyone at all. Mm. Um, every patient heals or cures themselves. I'm just there, right? And it's that, and I, it's a really, it kind of comes back to that idea of uh, healing is, is a restoration of, of like right relation or coming back into alignment, right? And it's Absolutely. always, I tell Mike, I, we're going to talk about energy healing and I'm new on that journey as a professional myself, but it's, you, I tell my clients that as well. I'm here and I can, I'm calling in these beings and doing that, but you do the healing. <laughs> yeah. you know, that's that's body what it is. is naturally a self-healing organism. Yeah. So we're really looking as to what things are obstructing that process, slowing it down or blocking it. And, yes. and that's awareness on the part of the, the client, really. They're gaining awareness. So, I mean, let's let's back this up. Uh when did you decide to get into energy healing? Like how that journey into things like Reiki, but not just that, because the book um, has a whole bunch of different modalities uh, in it. But like when, on a personal level, when did you decide to investigate and then actually move further on into this? Well, after decades of interest in esoterica, um, I was actually invited by friends who had recently started practicing Reiki. And I just went along to experience the energy for myself. And, and it just took off from there, Gordon. Um, I started getting the first degree initiation, second, moved on, got training, and started a decade-long uh, practice of like two nights a week. We had open house. So anyone who came would get a Reiki session. And the weekends were dedicated to training. So it was a massive chunk of time each week dedicated just to giving healing. So it, it just came out of being introduced to uh, Reiki and receiving the energy myself. And in that in that first session, obviously, you would have felt something, and I'll get you to describe that. But um, there's been a couple of moments for me in the last year and a bit with the, the Four Wind system where, uh, and I've, I've been doing magic for decades, well, two decades, I'm not that old, uh, there have been a couple of moments where I'm like, this is, I knew from the beginning it was like real, whatever that means. But there have yeah. been a few moments where I'm like, this is especially real. Uh, and and so there's that first kind of realization, oh, goodness, I can feel this. Uh, but then you'll get kind of, you know, the fireworks type events. Like, what were they for you? Well, the, meeting the uh, teacher that we decided to work with and, um, we were sit, sat there talking to her, and this she had enormous energy going. She was natural, um, Kundalini activated person. <laughs> Never mind the Reiki; she had other healing modalities. And as I talked with her, I began to have blobs of green color passing through my eyes. You know, and I, I kept rubbing my eyes. I was looking out the window. I they went away. I looked at her again, and they they started to coalesce. And uh, finally, it was like some green oil paint pouring over the surface of a body and mixed with a deep blue. 
And uh, as, as this experience unfolded, you know, she had this glowing emerald green aura all around her, you know. So for me, this was the first time that being in the presence of somebody who was energetically uh, intense, activated my own innate psychism in, in a very clear way. And, and these types of experience uh, continue to evolve whenever I was in her presence. I mean, seeing very fast moving objects passing through the room. I mean, it was extraordinary. So <laughs> being a, as we all are natural skeptics, you know, we all have this question mark in our minds. Um, you're nevertheless confronted by experiences which are totally out of the normal. Mm. Is this Kenzie? An accommodation somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Is this Kenzie? No, no, it wasn't. It, it was a very powerful healer um, about uh, 25 years ago mm -hmm. uh, that we trained with. Yeah, you can definitely find them. They're, they're definitely out yeah. there and around. <laughs> <laughs> so was that, I mean, that was it for you. It's like, okay, I'm going to, Oh, that was just the star for me. Uh, as we continued, um, for instance, a meditation with this woman, um, I entered this space, you know, it was incredible. It was like a black and white checkered floor. And uh, there was a coffin just on, the, on my right. And I was lying in it. And there was, wow. like, and I, I, I turned to the left and I suddenly went straight up into a pool of light. And, and shortly after this, this, this meditative vision, which obviously it was the third degree <laughs> Masonic Lodge I was in. Say. I'm not a mason, yeah. but yeah. I had somehow penetrated this egregore or something. And um, immediately after this experience, I just totally stopped smoking and drinking. I never wow. gave up. I never gave up. I just stopped. <laughs> in yeah. the, stopped in my tracks. And that was just one of many experiences I had with her. It's extraordinary. The um, the I, training. I can add one more to that, Gordon. Go During on. my second degree initiation, I also went straight into this pool of light, like a vertical ascent, and I became aware that I was surrounded by these loving presences. But the light was so intense, I couldn't make out a, a real detail of them. But I felt totally embraced. And it was such an acknowledgement and acceptance that when I suddenly found myself back in my body, it was an overwhelming sense of sadness at that, the loss of that. And this was an extraordinary experience, again, with the uh, same teacher. Wonderful. Yeah, The um, my mother is uh, an energy healer. She does um, pranic healing and met the Grand Master and all that kind of stuff. But that, that's her jam, her vibe. And so she's kind of, I mean, she's in her seventies now, so not doing much in the way, yeah. but if people swing by, they get help, but she, the, um, the shingle is no longer hung. Right. Anyway. Um, she called me the other day, we were chatting on the phone and she's like, how are you, the sessions going? Cause it's only been whatever it has been for me, four months. And the first thing I felt just to your point, um, drawn to say was it's such a privilege. Mm. Uh, it's, it's such a privilege working with these beings, like being, um, in service for Absolutely. these beings right and and yeah. that that's my feeling every time i have a client session is that it, it's a privilege to do yeah. it yeah, yeah. absolutely so that, I, I, yeah. the thing i noticed that with um giving reiki and going out and treating people who had various ailments um kind of cleansed the sickness of the persona if i can describe it as that that persona that's prone to highs and lows self-doubt the act of giving the healing even though it's not my energy just putting myself in the line so to speak kind of cleansed and 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 centered my life in a way mm. that the persona was not really capable of doing in a sustained way i yeah. think that was a valuable uh, lesson to be drawn from that I want to um, I want to go back to that. You immediately stopped smoking and drinking. Yeah. Uh, the the training had been quite good for me. From a, I was winding down the drinking last year anyway. I still drink, but certainly not the night before clients or something, and not like I used to. But uh, you can't 
you can't do it if you if you've drunk before. And the reason I want to mention that is I I don't know if you've ever read a book called Crossing into Medicine Country. It's quite old now, um, yeah. and it's about like uh, this guy in Oklahoma training with, uh, and I think she's Choctaw, but like an indigenous like powwow woman. Mm -hmm. And this guy, the narrator, is in his early twenties, and the the Choctaw woman is in her I don't know seventies. And she explains that if you want to be, um, if you want to be a curandero, if you want to do powwow, you can't drink ever. You have to stop uh, because this. And it's just a really interesting way that you find it in every system. But because that's a spirit based system, she described it as um, alcohol will attract wandering spirits to you and your energy and because they like it they like the alcohol they like that sense of intoxication and you won't remember it because you can't feel them when the alcohol's there and they will hang around you and every and they'll get in the way of the work and so you cannot drink if you and that that's like the that's a powwow description of the same thing which is that if you're going to move into doing this kind of healing uh that that kind of stuff <laughs> that kind of stuff is off the table yeah 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 amazing um, it's my experience yeah yeah <laughs> so coming back to the fields because in the book we were talking about the field as this sort of um all-encompassing metaphor but underneath that uh, in the book there's there's a couple of different ones there's like different notions of fields generated by the body and ancestral fields and so on how do you how do you, what is your framework for that kind of stuff? Like if you're, if you're seeing clients or if you're interpreting someone's um, current troubles or malaise, like, do you, do you have like a, a field based system where you go, okay, well, I'm going to check the etheric body. I'm going to check this and, and, and so on. Like, how does that work for you? You, know, you just immediately respond to whatever the client is, is telling you. I mean, that's the message. You, you don't have to go searching. It's not an analytic process. Um, you handle the presenting case, and, and that's sufficient. Uh, using energy healing techniques, um, you'll find that if the presenting issue is resolved, any underlying issues immediately pop up behind it. Mm -hmm. So that it's like you, you peel a layer, and, and, and the next layer presents itself. So you have disturbances in the field which are ready to be made psychically visible but which require top layers to be removed so the presenting issues are always good enough to work on they naturally lead inwards yeah. so yeah so you don't need an analytic process you just need to be more intuitive more accepting and and, and once you call in spirits you need to accept the fact that you need to be kind of out of it actually yeah. intellectually and, and, you know, it's going to come through. I know in, in the stories in the book, in a lot of Kenzie's cases, she gets an image or a, a word um, which has absolutely no connection with the story the client has brought in. In other words, it's directly drawn from the field, except she's, her intent is sufficient to navigate the field. Hmm. That's, the, that's the thing. You don't need to go searching in the field. You need to be open to it. And in a healing context, it will automatically bring forth the things that are necessary for that healing process to take place. And I yeah, say, yeah. especially so if you're working with spirits. Nice one. Speaking of Kenzie, who's Kenzie? Kenzie's my lifelong partner <laughs> and uh, one of the great healers. And I think her stories speak for themselves in the book. There's some amazing cases. She is a very intuitive healer, and she's developed a whole system of healing, uh, mind and is that, healing. And and how much of that? I mean, because she's she's clearly very versed in in a whole bunch of different um, you know modalities when, yeah. when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, and 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 how much of it is? I mean, I'm asking this question, but I kind of already know the answer to it, which is like how how much of it is her own system as well? Like in the end, um, the good ones bring through the right. Um, way of doing it for them right yeah i mean what we've seen is an evolution in energy healing from let's say thought field therapy back in the 70s through emotional freedom techniques which were becoming very popular during the uh, 80s now often called tapping 
tapping on the yeah. meridian or the head points of the meridian. Uh, <clears throat> and from there, we've now learned that, you know, surrogate tapping, distance tapping all works. So that the tapping is kind of not redundant per se, but secondary. Yeah, like the power isn't actually yeah um, in the fingers. <laughs> <Not actually> kinetic. <laughs> yeah. So um, I love and, I love EFT. I know it's a bit. I mean, I don't. I don't. Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely, everyone should have mastered EFT. I mean, in in the esoteric community by now, it's not that difficult. Like, it's not no. the, the the basics of it are not that difficult, right? It's not. You can't say everyone can go out and be an acupuncturist. That is a lifelong career, yeah. right? Yeah. But EFT isn't that. It's. I mean, it, um, they both work because of the reality of things like the field and energies. But yeah. so actually, for people who don't know, because I know amongst the membership, because we do a lot of um, group intending, again, like Lynn McTaggart's Power of Eight stuff, I know EFT is like clandestinely popular amongst the, the regular intenders. But yeah. tell people about it. Okay, I mean, the, the technique evolved by Gary Craig from a very complex uh, system, uh, Thorfield therapy. And, and Gary found that um, even the most powerful anxieties and fears can be resolved without a lot of emotional intensity. And this was the huge breakthrough with energy healing. You you leave aside the idea that you need to bring up emotions in a powerful way to cleanse yourself of them. Yeah. Actually, you're more likely to suffer re-traumatization yeah. by doing that, but let's leave that aside. Energy healing works better when the emotions are on a low level, but in which you're connected to them. So the, with a strong focus on a specific negative emotion, feeling, or thought, you simply tap on the head of the major meridian points, which are here, 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 here. And normally you continue tapping and then check the level of emotional arousal you have um, in relation to your anxiety, fear, whatever, um, and continue until you completely clear that. And it's easy, easy to measure your own level of clearing by simply give it a, a number of one to 10 in intensity. And then as you go round, do rounds of tapping, uh, you'll find that it's coming down. And once you reach zero, you'll find that that emotion is, is completely gone. Now, the amazing thing is Gary Craig demonstrated this with post-traumatic stress disorder amongst Vietnam veterans back in the 80s. And uh, he was able to take... I mean, PTSD is the most extreme and intractable anxiety disorder known today and still is uh, intractable yeah. to conventional medicine. Um, but he was able to knock it down in just one or two rounds of tapping. The recent clinical trials done just a few years ago have taken groups of people with PTSD and in the space of two rounds of tapping, they brought it down to a minor anxiety. Yeah, so th this is now on a clinical level established, not that it is in any way modifying how PTSD is actually treated in the it world. Does, it does my head in, Peter, right? Because I've, I've pulled some of these stats from the book, because obviously, if you're listening, guys, this is all covered in the book. Uh, yeah. the, in six sessions, there yeah. was an 87% um ptsd negative score scored ptsd yeah. negative 87 percent of them in just six sessions now why that's top of mind for me is the end of last year i participated in mind medicine australia's annual conference about um the clinical use of psychedelics etc cetera, etc cetera, mm -hmm. right and i learned from that that not only is um ptsd more or less um untreatable like mm -hmm. a, like chronic conditions yeah. we, the west calls things chronic if they can't fix them because yeah. their model is wrong right uh, yeah. But I found out from the guys who were doing the um, a lot of the MDMA trials for people with PD PTSD that not only can we not treat it now, we are actually worse at treating it at the like here in the 21st century than we were in the 1930s. So we have worse outcomes for people with PTSD now. So yeah. millions and billions go into psychiatry and like heart disease, like everything else. It's getting the more money we put in, the worse we get at it. And it, yeah. it's amazing. And, and the, the transformative effects and why, I, why I'm bringing up the MDMA stuff is 
Um, if you can't, if you have PTSD and you can't get yourself on an MDMA trial, not that I would ever judge anyone for attempting to uh, do something like that themselves with friends and sitters and, and all the rest of it, but it works in the same way that EFT does. It's it's literally uh, effectively releasing um, the energy associated with those um, with those traumas, right? Because yeah. MDMA puts you in in a space to re-experience. The events, so you might be an Afghanistan vet or something, mm -hmm. to re-experience the events without the energy, without the actual trauma, right? And mm -hmm. and to to be in a space where you can release it, and yeah. EFT does that without the dance music and glow sticks. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So we, we we've known this since the eighties when Gary Craig demonstrated it and filmed the cases and made them available, but it doesn't seem to have affected mainstream medicine whatsoever that said we have a lot of psychotherapists and psychiatrists doctors coming to us for training in these techniques i, I have to say that they are out there amongst medical professionals uh, even reiki is out there amongst <laughs> medical professionals but it's the kind of it's the third rail you know you don't, yeah. <laughs> don't want to admit it <laughs> Yeah, and that whole thing is growing. Um, and and the the events of the past two years, if they have a bright spot, is is the realization of of the um, the limitations of not just the global medical economy and and system, right? Yeah. Uh, but its worldview, its its worldview has been uh, definitely pulled up short. And and it's for people like us who are maybe. You know, not to pat ourselves too much on the back, but I've I've been through that. I have made like Western medicine as a framework small already because I know like I've experienced all this other stuff and I'm very passionate about. I actually hate calling them alternative therapies because yeah. the the rest of the world thinks this way. Like the rest of the world, the West, the majority of people on Earth will have a, a normal access to a normal quote unquote medical system that uh, understands the existence of energy like if you actually just add china and india together yeah you will right. actually get a medical system that not yeah. just will incorporate it without it being a third rail but yeah. will fund studies like it's as if it's anything else that's done yeah. in medicine another uh, point on that is that strangely uh, pulsed electromagnetic frequency therapy is acknowledged within western medicine and it's strange because, like, they haven't made the connection. What they're doing there is feeding back a range of extremely low-frequency electromagnetic pulses to the body. This is in, in the range 0.5 to about 60 hertz or cycles per second, which is exactly the frequency range uh, generated by different parts of the body. And, and the same frequency range is, is that generated in the hands of healers. Yeah. It's also the frequency range coming out of Reiki, except the amplitude of the waves is like 900 to 1,000 times larger. So actually, it's already in Western medicine, but the, there's some kind of, I don't know, pharmacological barrier there. It's the ideology that only like matter exists, right? And yeah, right. We're, we're, we're experiencing that now, which is funny because it, the, you know, there's radiation therapy, so yeah. riddle me that. But yeah. I actually think most of allopathic medicine works accidentally. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you gave an example of like they actually, uh, you know, so you you can get treated for things um, with pharma drugs. And I don't think any of the ones that are successful work the way they think they work. <laughs> I literally think the whole thing, because the, the framework is like, oh, this molecule does this. We've, we learned that with psychiatric drugs. That whole thing, SSRIs, the rest of it, not yeah. correct, right? Oh, yeah. more specifically, the serotonin hypothesis, which I see all the time or used to see all the time when I use yeah. Twitter, hasn't yeah. been current for 25 years. And so the whole framework of... Um, curing depression or at least mitigating the symptoms the outward symptoms of depression by altering the chemicals in the brain yeah they found themselves that wasn't correct 25 years ago and, and, and so whilst you can get benefits there's really good ones um like beta blockers that are used for hearts also good for anti-anxiety yeah. and yeah. and so on and they don't they work in a in the body in a way that can provide help but i actually don't think they work in the way 
the guys <laughs> who invented them do because it, it, they can't, right? Like it's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, the whole thing kind of like accidentally runs on on magic. Uh, and I should sort of point out the other thing uh, because people get kind of annoyed about that. It's like, well, what about surgery or blah blah blah? It's like, listen, what in my training, what Alberto said was. If you are in a car accident, don't have the ambulance take you to your shaman. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Emergency uh, medicine, you need Western medicine. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's crisis and tr like bodily yeah. crisis medicine. It's the best. Yeah, yeah. What he does say is like, go to see the shaman afterwards to find out why you're in that accident. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but don't like, and, and this is funny. Like I have this naive fantasy that, the whole planet actually has one coherent system of medicine mm -hmm. and the West quote unquote, the West got the trauma bit of like stitching people up and, and setting bones and, and yeah. swapping hearts out and whatever. Um, and, and it's good at it. It's not good at any of the other stuff. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's using this battlefield medicine of patching people up and sending them out into a world that made them sick in the first place, rather than doing it. It's using this, it's pretending the only medicine in the world is battlefield medicine. So it turns around yeah. and sees everything like that. And yeah, it's yeah. just, it, I think that's the thing that's coming to an end as a result of this, um, uh, no, this so. world story we're moving through. Strangely, um, when they found that body um, entombed in the ice in the Alps, uh, I think they called this, this, this Neolithic or Bronze Age man, uh, Utsi. Utsi, yes, Utsi, the yeah. Iceman. I studied him in history. I, I love him. I studied him in history in high school. He's covered in these tattoos that exactly correspond, don't they, to the uh, physical problems that his body uh, has been diagnosed as suffering from. So that yeah. there was a system of natural acupuncture alive and well <laughs> in bronze to Neolithic Europe, which is extraordinary. So, yeah, we, we've lost a lot with the great technological leap of the later centuries. Mm. See. see, that um, I didn't know because I, I studied him in high school. So I studied him in the late 90s and I was obsessed with it. I, mm. I read stuff that I didn't need to because it's just high school history. Yeah. But I bought the like the paperback, the whole book about the Iceman. Oh, yeah. and <laughs> I went nuts on it. I loved it. And so I could tell you that when I read about Otzi in, in your book, that yeah. I didn't, that information is new in the last 20 something years since I was at yeah. the end of high school, right? Because yeah, yeah. I, I distinctly remember studying the marks on the Iceman's body and, and being told like, we don't know what these are for. They're not like, some of them are just like three little lines in a row. So it's not even, yeah. um, some of them are clearly, some of the tattoos are clearly ceremonial because they look like a thing, but yeah. most of them aren't. They're just like a little line or some dots. Yeah. Uh, and they're like, we don't know what this is. And it was literally, they're like, bear in mind, he was kind of primitive. So we don't really know what that is. And then 20 years later in the book, um, I get, I've got the exact numbers because this is, uh, so 80% of Otzi's 58 tattoos correspond to the same points used in by modern acupuncturists. Yeah. That's 80%. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Uh, I, I think that's brilliant. And that, that was like maybe my highlight of the book because I was such an Iceman nerd as a kid. Glad you found that in the book, Gordon. <laughs> yeah, nice one. So we've done EFT. What are some of the other kind of like energy psychology modalities that you that are described in the book that maybe people should know about? Because I will actually mention one of the things I appreciated about this is that it's quite it's sort of a Lynn McTaggarty book, but more from the inside, in that this isn't a practical guide to uh energy healing. There's some techniques in there for sure. But it's a really good overview of uh, a bunch of different modalities that are kind of caught underneath that framework yeah. and also personal experiences of people um, who've gone through them. And it's quite a powerful combination. But for I realized I hadn't mentioned that that's kind of the structure of the book. Um, so tell us about some of them, like in particular MCH. Well, this is um, Kenzie's development after, you know, 25 years of professional healing. Uh, she sees maybe two or three people a day at times, like five or six days a week. So I think there's about five or 6,000 cases in, in the files at the moment. And, and what she found is as we 
discussed earlier is that the kinetic approach of EFT um, is okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but the, there's a far more leverage approach that you can take. That's to say, if you implant a healing instruction into one's own field, you can then activate that whenever you need it. So that in effect, you, you leverage the power of the heal itself to self-correct. And, and that's the mind connection healing uh, process that she's developed. So th that's one of the modalities now used alongside Reiki. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty well with like Reiki and mind connection healing does most of it. You'll always get cases which are complicated, you know, past lives and, and being reborn in, into the same family or having siblings who've died before or or in in one case we even had somebody who'd had a literally a spell cast on them yeah so the ability to flex between a couple of different techniques can be very useful yeah and and sometimes i i, I compare the application of the techniques as point techniques on a specific emotion and sometimes when people cannot articulate or do not want to articulate their, their underlying distress. You can use something like breath work, which yes. generates a field effect within your energy field. In other words, it raises the total energy gain very, very rapidly in the case of rebirthing. But in that case, um, the outcome is less discernible immediately. It tends to work itself out in the ensuing days and weeks after so that you, you find your life shifting and and things that were problems in the past cease to be so. Yeah, so that's um, what, I love that. What I, what I wanted to illustrate in the book is the range of these techniques and how they were actually applied in specific cases, so you can see the outcomes. Yeah, and that should give people a guide as to which techniques they may be interested in in trying out themselves or even learning and and becoming proficient in. Yeah, because we certainly need more people doing it. But I, I, the other thing I think it does is gives people the um, the mental room's not the right word for it. The, the space they may have been through a process, they may have self healed, or had an encounter from something quite serious. Like some of the examples in the book of people who've had, you know, crippling fears of heights to the point they can't stand on a single step, and it's yeah. you know gone like that. Yeah, and that that's actually a lot more common than people realize. And you might have had, you know, it, it's really validating, I think, for people to who've maybe overcome a particular challenge, either accidentally, quote unquote, through energy work or um, have had an experience. Or if you are suffering with these things, like, can these help me? Like, miracles are there to be had, right? Yeah, and, at, and your, think, at your fingertips. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fingertips. And, and I think that's like, I, I like that about the book. It's actually, it's very yeah. validating for that. Because yeah. I, I mean, you know, I got clients and it's, it's a classic thing. It's funny. You mentioned like clients who aren't necessarily forthcoming, but mm. ones who are sort of like, no, I'm, I'm just pretty keen to see what this is. Like, what is it? The, what, what can you do? Mm. Uh, and, and that's it, fair with like a shamanic modality because there are mm. some very specific things. You can list them off the soul retrieval, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But it's sort of, it can do anything. And these, these te techniques can, <laughs> can all do anything. Yeah. The, the, the other case is when the clients just want to talk and talk and talk about their problems. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, here you've got a technique. Okay, we can actually do this now. <laughs> we can actually clear this. You know, the talk thing is not necessary. No, so, I, and yeah. I, that's an, another good example of something that I think, although, like, say, Jungians are better at it, but I think it's, an, it's something that I heard very, very early on when I listened to some Jordan Peterson stuff, whatever that was, like four years ago, yeah. where he said it's not clear why talk therapy actually works. Like yeah. it's not clear scientifically why talking about your problems leads to healing. And it's another one of those examples of things that Westerners do that work almost accidentally. Like yes. the, the reality that um, creates these modalities. So the, the sort of belief system that creates talk therapy thinks it works in a certain way but it doesn't. <laughs> it still works. And, and certainly I know plenty of people who get tremendous like enrichment, particularly the Jungian depth psychology stuff out, out of yeah, yeah. Um, going, going through it. But it's one of them. I love it. It doesn't actually, um, how they think it works isn't how, um, yeah. how it provides healing. 
Uh, I think in that context as well, we should point out that EFT is like free. Yeah. You know, you can watch the <laughs> YouTube <laughs> basic steps. And do you it. Can try it out on yourself. You know, you can. It doesn't require any huge investment. Um, are you are you familiar with Dr. Bradley Nelson's Emotion Code? No, I, I know the book. I, yeah. I, I've heard of him. I, I'm not actually aware of the process. It's, it's very similar to EFT. It's it's even dare I say easier in many respects than, than um, EFT. It's very specifically for unearthing trapped emotions, and it's a little bit to. I have a, a helping spirit who actually quite quite likes it. So. Mm. Um, yeah, but it, does, it it works with a prime meridian as well, except you use a magnet. But you you essentially do body testing to find yeah. what what the trapped emotion is and where it yeah. is, and you use a magnet um, down the prime meridian, so basically from yeah, effectively yeah. the third eye as far yeah, down yeah. towards the back of your spine. If you're doing it on someone, you get them the whole way over the top of the head down the spine. Yeah. And you do that yeah. three times with the magnet, and you release the trapped emotion, and it's just, it's yeah. transformative. Well, I mention it because we're moving into the new Q1 course for members and it's about um, protection and Malefica and a lot of stuff where people think there's a really compli complex area, hence the whole um, like course. But one of the best things you can do diagnosing whether someone has worked some magic on you is clear a lot of those, those trapped emotions that are that can present as the same kind of symptoms as, as someone having worked you, right? So, like, and, and speaking of it being free, because Dr. Nelson teaches courses, the book is available free PDF on his website. And right. there's a series of videos on YouTube. If people are watching this now on YouTube, type mm -hmm. in the emotion code and in 40 minutes, get a fridge magnet. You'll yeah. learn, <laughs> you'll know how to do it. And it's yeah, amazing. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like, it's like EFT. It can do, well, it is basic. It's a very similar, it's, yeah. it's bringing, emotions or or um trauma in a um, non-violent way to the surface so it can be released right so yeah, it's the same yeah I, mean, I mean we have used magnets by the way um you know like coated in rubber and you like roll it on the spine so we you know, i haven't talked about that but yes that's a modality yeah. we've used also i've done um i've used crystals to like remove um blockage from somebody you know, there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of stuff you can try out. <laughs> yeah, and that was I think that was my point a few questions ago was uh well one, the, the Western system that is explaining poorly how this works, but also the thing that works for your friend, so they might really have got a lot out of let's just use these two examples of the emotion code mm -hmm. and EFT. They might have just had a really um, profound healing experience doing some uh, releasing of trapped emotions via the emotion code yeah. and you don't get much out of it, but you might vibe with EFT, like the, the, the systems. And, and more importantly, I think you can go through phases yourself where one particular challenge or, or trauma or situation is more responsive to acupuncture or, or yeah. Reiki or so on. And, yeah. uh, and that's really useful for people, I think, to go, look, just, Try it, especially the free ones, <laughs> to start yeah. with, and and like go on that journey of, of finding which parts uh, or what things are, are right for you right now. Yes, totally agree. Nice one, nice one. So you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, and it's the fun bit about, uh, and it kind of comes back to what Dr. Um, Dr. Four said. You only you get like a day into doing this kind of work before all of a sudden you are dealing with past life stuff or you know um someone cursed your family line 900 years ago and all these things that just seem so extreme or yeah. odd um but they aren't they appear to be really commonplace and it's just one of the things i think we've forgotten over the last 300 years maybe how to clean up but tell us about that tell us about things like past lives and 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 the the sort of exciting epistemological uh, edges of work like this well, for me, a um, huge eye-opener early on was, was attending family constellation therapy. Uh, just as a, you know, not, not to have the therapy, but as an observer. And as you may know, in that modality, as an observer, you get called upon to help. <laughs> so yeah. what happened to me there is we, we went along and there's a group of strangers in the room. There's two or three people who were wanting therapy and a therapist. And uh, one of these... Um, 
people wanting therapy selects randomly almost from the audience, from the, from the group of supporters, people to represent key elements of, say, their family dynamic, father, mother, whatever, and places them in the middle of the room in relation to uh, each other to suggest how that dynamic works as far as they perceive it. They then sit down, and this is the extraordinary thing, Gordon, the people who are complete strangers standing in the middle of the room obtain a emotional overlay. That's to say, whilst remaining fully in possession of their own sense of themselves, they have an additional overlay of emotions, thoughts, feelings, even physical posture of people who are not there. In it's, other words, yeah. of the family members that they're representing. So by symbolically creating a space, you generate a field that allows non-local access to the thoughts, memories, even if the people you're representing are long dead. It doesn't matter. And this is extraordinary. This, this is the generation of a field in a ritual space. And then using that ritual space to correct the field. In other words, to remove its traumatic and unbalanced aspects and recode the field in effect in, in a harmonious way. And this for me encapsulates the whole healing uh, process on a much grander scale. This is what we're about. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're intervening in the field to correct and harmonize it. And, and it's a local phenomenon that has global implications. Absolutely, because if it if it works like that, and I was actually just listening to a Tom Powen, a Tom Cowan podcast about biogeometry, uh, this stuff works. Well, we mostly only use it on humans, but the fact that it works means that it works on everything in the cosmos. Yes. And it's this is where we were sort of talking about animism being a dangerous idea whose time has come. Yeah. Uh, we part of our healing is is the awareness that we are in this community of beings called the cosmos and these the implications of these techniques are we should be intending praying for and whatever our rivers not just although certainly cleaning them up uh, mm -hmm. there's this whole thing about being a human in a body that is implied with the um the seemingly extreme although as natural as breathing when you do them techniques like um, uncovering people's past lives or constellation therapy it means that the dead are never gone but it also means that for good and bad um, consequences and, and relationality are are here and it also i think gives you a telos that is um is healing for yourself so you can lift ancestral or family trauma in a non-judgmental way, right? So there's, and, and Dr. Four has a lot to say about that. So you might, your grandfather might have done really terrible things to you as, if you were a kid, right? Like some really yeah. traumatic stuff. Uh, and so how, the fact is that if that trauma is still in your body, that means it's still in the universe. And 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 releasing that is not a, um, it's not making it okay that it happened or any of that stuff. It is yeah. simply... It's simply the cleanup, the like a divine cleanup, right? And yeah. and that uh, that works for deforestation. That that's the same yes. thing for, for any of this stuff. Yeah. Hence systemic constellations, as to say, when you expand the focus or the symbolic representation outside of the family to to some other system. Yeah. And this this is an area where people can really start to experiment. Yeah. And they should. <laughs> yeah, they <absolutely. laughs> There's some yeah, cool stuff. Uh, struck me about this, Gordon, is that many of these um, problems, ancestral problems, have a distinct ethical component. And I've argued in the book that, therefore, the ethical component must be an integral part of the field. Mm -hmm. Since everything is in the field now, we're not talking about, um, you know, panpsychism and animism now. So sure. all that we are is in the field, which means that the, the field itself is an ethical bearer, so to speak. Now, what yes. do we mean by that? This needs a, a little careful unpacking. <laughs> we're not talking about moral judgments. We're talking about the acknowledgement of someone at a very profound level. The fact that they're not treated as something less. 
yeah. that they're not abused, that, that there's a, a respect for the sovereignty of the individual yeah. passing through lives, through time. So, you know, for me, this was an important insight into the operation of the field and, and how the healing work plays into the spiritual evolution of life streams. Yes, I like that. That's a really good way of saying it. Yeah. It's the, the framework in sort of Cairo cosmology for the, the perennial philosophical question of suffering. Uh, mm. If everything's in the field and the field has, morality is the wrong word. Uh, mm. If the field is some sort of, is benign or loving, then how do these, like, what, like, how does it address things like suffering and what we would call in the West evil? Because a lot of other systems don't necessarily have evil. They might have malicious. Yeah. And, and the way I had it explained to me in the training was that, um, so suffering, if something is causing suffering, suffering is not supposed to exist. Well, um, if something's causing suffering, it means it's out of right relation. And yeah. so the universe will actually remove like you would um, prune, but it's not in, it's not as intentional as that. It's actually the, the universe basically composts the things that aren't right. So when you're looking at something like um, punishment or karma or like, well, what about evil people? It's more because that's a challenging word, right? Yeah. If there is conflict, the, the universe is seeking, like like any living system, like your own body is seeking to heal itself. So what what looks like evil to us these people aren't necessarily out of the field they're sort of not being able to get out of it but the field will eventually kind of like recompost it or, or bring it back into right relation and it's a kind of like a it's a really nice it's a nice framework to sit with and um, depending on where people are in a particular trauma journey and how much anger and rightfully so they're still holding for um individual things that were perpetrated against them there yeah. are frameworks that may resonate on that healing journey i guess mm. Mm. nice one um speaking of like there is some I, I put them up on the screen share there's some fun there's a sequence of fun photos uh in the in the book which uh which i think we should show what do you reckon yeah sure all right um, I, wanna, I, I took these photographs in 2002 with one of the first you know simple digital cameras and it's of a Reiki teacher graduation uh, ceremony, if you like, you know, acknowledging yeah. the, the completion of the training. And when I took the group photo, it was as though I took a photograph with a flash directly into a mirror. The light just flashed straight back into, <laughs> into the view. So I took another one and then another. And finally, the fourth one, I think it looked kind of clear. And it was only yeah. when I... I got the digital uh, images on, onto the screen that I could see it was actually a field generated by Kenzie as she invoked the Reiki energy. And, and that is that is what it appears to depict. It's actually yeah. a manifestation of the Reiki energy. Uh, and I can only assume that it was done purposefully. That's to say it chose to manifest. Yeah, it's... Uh... I like it. I have one. It's it's on the blog years ago uh, when I was still in the UK, and I took my, my parents came visiting, and we went to Cornwall, and we went to St Nectan's Keeve, and again, Mother Pranakila and so on. Um, she's like, "Oh, we'll probably get orbs," and I'm like, mm. "Yeah, we'll get orbs because again, old cameras because this is ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll get orbs because we're visiting a waterfall and there's moisture in the air." And it will backscatter with the camera, yeah. right? And that's true. So I took one. She went and stood in the thing, stood in the um, waterfall. I took the photo, orbs, right? Um, and so she said, Do you want me to take another one? She says, Wait a minute. And she's like, politely asked them <laughs> to go <laughs> take the next photo, nothing. Yeah. Take the photo after that, which she's asked them to come back. There they yeah. are. <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> Yeah, those early digital cameras were better at it because um, there's actually more computing intelligence in, in current digital cameras and phones yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. cleans up, uses yeah, AI sure. to like clean up 
stuff sure. that you used to get with film and and so on and you got with yeah. the early digital cameras yeah this is one of the first digital cameras i think it was so simple mechanism you know anyway there nice it is <laughs> so um hang on no i've done that one we've done the past i want to come back to the past life thing um mm. because uh maybe it was two years ago now we, with the premium members we did some uh contract clearing it's a bit more of a, a shamanic technique and i want to i want to come back to this and i want you to give me some um wild stories about it because <laughs> it's important when you are processing information, I'll tell you my contract in a minute and, and explain why, but when you're processing this information, well, you don't process it at the time that you experience or release it, right? So I ended up releasing um, contracts um, that obviously no longer serve the family line and so on. And what I was shown as I was doing this was my family hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years ago in another galaxy was working for some sort of like intergalactic uh weapons dealers like gun running but across planets i come back and go that I, what am i supposed to do with that and the answer is nothing um because it's it worked and 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 so when you're in the sessions it's you will rarely get ones as weird as that and mm. and go with it and don't self-censor and, uh, and and don't judge because you don't like what i think was good in the book when you treat past lives is like we don't actually know I mean, I think they do happen. I think I think we do come to Earth as many times as we want or need to. But yeah, we don't actually. You don't need to have an opinion on that no. to um, to be healed from an experience that the person guiding you through it may may frame as a past life, right? Yeah, put it this way: your misleading belief systems shouldn't bear on your capacity to actually heal and feel better <laughs> and more functional in life. <laughs> Because it's quite a good uh, story of someone, I think it was an engineer or someone sciencey who, um, yeah, yeah, end up with this. I get a lot, um, I think different techniques attract more of it, although maybe you could prove me wrong. I don't know how often it comes up in Reiki, but mm. it comes up uh, once every four sessions, I think, in in like a, in a shamanic modality, which is definitely more spirit forward, I yeah. suppose. But, I mean, have you got stories like, being, were you ever an interdimensional um, gun runner in another galaxy? No, I don't Anything have like that. that. Kind. Uh, I've had encounters with interdimensional beings, um, but I've not not actually bothered myself with probing past lives. Right. I mean, I have a sense of them, but it's a kind of irrelevant from my present perspective. Um, there are several strange encounters uh, in the book. I don't know whether you want to address any specific Pick ones. one, or even if it's no, not in the book, where, where, the weird part of the, where the weird part of the show towards the end. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, again, let's see if you can talk. Uh, I had, my family had a contract millions of years ago and it was like a family contract as far as I could see that like went down generations. And yeah. so the family was literally bonded or in bondage to these, to this like, gun running cartel and yeah. i have no idea because this is the wonderful thing about what i mean but you don't really i think they happen but you don't really know with past lives what you're dealing with is the the sort of infinite variability and creativity of the unconscious and yeah. and it showed something to me in that way which i was able to clear and release and so yay <laughs> right yeah, yeah. T t tell us some weird stories some, some of the cases um i've encountered have been intractable so they're they're a bit of a bit of a bummer. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to bring people down. There are entities out there of a strength and purpose which you know m most of us cannot counteract. Um, but my suspicion is that the explanation for what happens lies in past lives and the recurrence of a strong possession type experience for somebody. I mean, going on for decades and including physical abuse and, and sexual abuse is that possibly the people have contracted themselves to those entities in previous lives. And I'm assuming that they've done so in a magical context um, in order to trade some benefit at that time, mm -hmm. but not realizing that what made them kind of invulnerable 
in a past life was the fact that they were anchored to a material body then. And since then, <laughs> they, they've lost the material anchorage. And it's made them very much subject to those entities in subsequent lives who are literally coming back to claim on a contract that was set up previously. Yeah. And so, Thanks. you know, when we've attempted to intervene on these cases, uh, we've made very little progress. And, uh, you know, you kind of, in a community of healers, you'll have like an escalation chain. There's some people who are very gifted spiritually. So you'll want to push those cases up because you, you, you know they're outside your own um, competence. And when those people get threatened by that entity, that if they intervene, they'll be next. You know, you've kind of reached the ceiling of what can be dealt with. And uh, there's a couple of cases like that. They're very extreme, but they do force the issue. How is it that an entity has such a connection, such a strong and obsessive connection with somebody in this life that doesn't serve any purpose whatsoever? It's just a kind of haunting or possession of that individual. And then these individuals have tried, you know, one case, they tried every healing approach Western medicine has. You know, they went for heart scans, brain scans, the overnight stay to check sleep apnea, psychiatry, psychotherapy, uh, whole courses of drugs. And the phenomena just went on completely indifferent. And this was a high-functioning individual, one of the case. I mean, active as a, a financial accountant for a major multinational. It's not as though these people are in any way, you know, disabled. They're high-functioning high individuals, except they have this terrible, persistent possession phenomena going on in their lives. So it, it it's interesting, but um, ultimately it's kind of leads to a dead end. It, it takes you close to those cases where you have UFO abduction phenomena, for instance. Um, and again, you have this, this is where I think, you know, the, the contrast between um, higher frequency and other dimensional has a strange kind of crossover point. Because what you seem to be dealing with is something which has a physical reality, but uh, impinges on our physical reality. It certainly doesn't seem to be a higher frequency um, entity yeah. or being. Okay, and and again, you have the sexual element in as much as what to us appears to be a sexual element is actually predation. Okay, it's predation enacted through a sexual. Um, mummery which has a completely different underlying purpose in, in the case of the abduction scenario it's the uh, extraction of uh, genetic material reproductive material and in the case of some of these entities it's actually life energy that's being drawn off yeah okay so you know i, I just want to you know the this is very much at the extreme envelope of the the energy healers work uh, yeah. but it is there it is there it's the fun stuff. Um, well, not really. The ones that can be the ones that can be addressed uh, are the fun stuff. I, I, yeah. Um, yes, I see. What These you are mean. instructive, Gordon. They're very instructive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once you open the doorway to these other <laughs> beyond the persona, you know, it's, it kind of gets limitless out there. Well, so that's one of the things that I think people struggle like uh, just go back to my millions of or hundreds of thousands of year other galaxy type stuff let's take make a more simple one uh, a client whose mother's mother's line 900 years ago in germany um basically cut a deal with the witch um and it was stuff that had flowed down the family line and this witch has subsequently died but the deal is still in place the thing is yeah. the whole point of what we we began the discussion with when talking about working at the level of the field healing energy at the level of the field and so on is that it is um and this is almost quantum how we experience time is not how time actually is so when you are beings that are um field beings let's just say yeah it's no different. 900 years ago, Germany and today, like it's yeah, walking across a room. Yeah. So <laughs> people think, why is this still in play? It's like, what do you think? They kept it in the fridge the whole time? Like it's, that's yeah, not right. how these, that's not how uh, it works. And that's, again, I, I'm telling people that because if you, 
if you experience this stuff or if you have some intimation of it, yeah, it's this is why it uh, this is why it's still in play. You think, oh, it can't be that. It must be this. It might be something else, but you can't dismiss it. That was a long time ago. Yeah. Time doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that, that's a mistake. That's a exactly. Mistake. <laughs> so, what should we leave them? What should we leave people with? Who, uh, other than, of course, uh, get the book and give yourself an overview of some of the shall we say adventures out there in the field yeah. um <laughs> but what else can we leave people with is like a step one i mean this is a fairly sophisticated audience when it comes to things like magic and so on but pretend it sure. isn't pretend <laughs> pretend they're not sophisticated um what's a good baseline if people are like right cool i'm going to start taking my energetics seriously on a personal basis because as you mentioned at the opening this is a really good time um to look at overall health mental health immune system etc cetera, etc cetera. What's a good step one? Okay, detoxify. Mm. Step one always has to be, and that, that's diet. You really have to watch what you're consuming. Is it food or is it a food product? <laughs> yeah. A lot of food products on the market today, a lot of drinks. You need to watch out for sugar, you know, salt, and, and all that processed stuff. It really affects your energy body in an intense way and closes down your awareness. So that has to be there, you know, it has to be there with decent level of exercise. We're all under exercising, you know, <laughs> for the past two years. I mean, I can't imagine how much, much muscle loss we've suffered, you know. Uh, it, does, so. it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it does my head in. And the trouble, the thing about that is I happen to know that Lynn McTaggart's research on, um, muscle growth the people who basically visualized muscle growth for the same amount of time as the group that actually did the uh, muscle training grew muscle at the same speed but did i do that over the last two years <laughs> when i when i couldn't get so when i couldn't spend an hour in the gym did i spend an hour visualizing muscle growth i did not and no. i know it works <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. the next step they, they should uh, get hold of two of the energy healing modalities, you know, a field one, rebirthing or Reiki, always Reiki, and, and something like start with, off with EFT or mind connection healing. Yeah. EFT is a real easy start, you know, you can just get going with it. You don't need uh, to have a lesson. And that should, that, that should be sufficient really to set an agenda for the next six to 12 months if you pursue those healing modalities so that you master them okay and with reiki that means you give energy to other beings you know the cats the dogs you know i can tell you that they recognize the energy in your field I've, I've had dogs you know come into a park and like cross 300 meters of space to present their bellies to me and the owners say, oh, yeah, she had an operation a week ago. You know, the, the, the animals immediately react to the, to the energy. Um, so, yeah, give yourself a healing agenda to work on over the space of six to 12 months. If it's Reiki, you need a detox. You need to practice it every single day for at least 10 days um, to build up a good feeling in your hands that the energy is there a lot of people get the reiki initiation but then they don't use it and then they come to doubt whether it's actually there or not so you know it, it's actually these are these are disciplines and practices and i know you have a highly disciplined community so they're going to understand what i'm saying anyway yeah definitely yeah, yeah. so that's good so that's um detox body movement because that's definite baseline stuff for mental yeah. health as well i mean like you know, um, any of that detox, it, you, you might be cursed, but we won't know until you stop eating seed oils. <laughs> uh, I think that's, yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely fair. All right. Where can people go to find out about yourself and the book? PeterMarkAdams.com. Uh, yeah, I have that. Of course, it's, it's on Inner, Inner Traditions. It's on Amazon. Um, and there's a mindconnectionhealing.com site. If they want to check that out, uh, mindconnectionhealing.com. Yeah, Kenzie's yeah. site. Um, you know, they can contact her if, if people want healing sessions or anything. Um, it's going to pull that one. And, out now. and for yourself, Gordon, I want to say we're all eagerly waiting to read 
animistic. Nice. I cannot wait. Um, I'm really yeah. excited to see it out here. Oh, look, here we go. Mind Connection Healing. Yeah. Um, I'm, this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, my first time driving StreamYard as well. So, yeah, right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, sir. And um, yeah, it's it's lovely to catch up. Always, always lovely to catch up. Oh, biannual. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll have to do it. <laughs> hey, look. To yeah, we're not just like co Scarlet Imprint authors now. We're like, you know, energy <laughs> colleagues. So we can do this. Yeah, right. <laughs> nice one. Well, all right, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, no, absolutely. And congrats on the book. Pleasure. Thank you very much. See you. Take care now. Bye bye.